The purpose of this episode is to explore common health and well-being strengths and challenges for people with Down syndrome. The content discussed here is not meant as a substitution for direct medical care with relevant professionals. Rather, we hope to share new and little known information so that families and supporters can be well informed when accessing medical care. Your child or student's medical or educational professionals may have recommended different practices or procedures that are specific to your child or student. Do not modify or change your child's treatment or therapy plan without consulting with your care provider first. Today on the Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast, Dr. Avin Pointer give us the lowdown on children's health. Over to you, Hina and Marla. Thanks, Andrew. It's Marla here. I'm an SLP and co-host of the Lowdown podcast, where we discuss all things Down Syndrome. I'm here with my most marvelous colleague, Hina, senior OT at the DSRF. Hi, Hina. Hi, Marla. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about something interesting that all of the families go through when their child is young. And one of the most challenging aspects of living with Down syndrome or having a person with Down syndrome in your life is the very frequent contact with the medical system from the get-go. Um, people with DS experience a raft of health challenges that might require support from a range of medical specialties. These kind of things include cardiology, neurology, oncology, ENT, GI, psychiatry, urology, ophthalmology, audiology, and the list goes on. It's a lot of ologies. That's a lot of ologies. It's a lot of ologies. <laughs> really big list. Um, and parents report to us that the, it's a real challenge to keep track of these appointments, chase down test results, and make decisions around what kind of procedures we are going to do or we're not going to do, and what interventions you need or don't need, and how do we prioritize all this information coming in. And on the other hand, primary care physicians have also contacted us asking sort of the same questions because the medical profile of a student with Down syndrome is very complicated and it's a lot for a family doctor to have too. And in a lot of cases, family doctors might have one or two people with Down syndrome on their whole caseload at a time. Mm -hmm. And so they may or may not have a lot of experience with people with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a whole, whole complicated topic. Yeah, and I think with our guests today, we're hoping to kind of bridge that gap a little bit yeah. so that parents can kind of get some knowledge and hopefully other doctors that might be listening can also kind of get a perspective yeah. from somebody in their own field. So yeah, so today we have the pleasure of getting the pediatric medical lowdown from Dr. Avon Pointer. Um, Dr. Pointer is a newly retired pediatrician and the president of the BC Pediatrics Society. She's the winner of the Distinguished Community Pediatrician Award and has been a clinical assistant professor at UBC or the University of British Columbia. Um, Dr. Pointer had her uh, practice in Langley, BC, um, and she has also contributed to legislative documents advocating for increased screening and care for neurodiverse children. Dr. Pointer, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, we are delighted. I know we're very we excited are, yeah. to have you here. Um, so before we kind of get into the serious stuff, we uh, have a tradition at the Lowdown now where we ask five secret questions to our guests. Don't panic. They're really fun <laughs> icebreaker <laughs> questions. No math or anything involved. Just for our listeners to, and for us to get to know you a little bit better. Um, OK, so our first question is, what is the most beautiful place you visited in BC? There's two most beautiful places. Mm. One is the Okanagan, where mm. I grew up. Mm -hmm. okay. I love the semi-desert and the lake. Great. It and the gorgeous. other is the Fraser Valley, where I live now. Yeah. Oh. It's green. I love the farms. I love the rainforest. Yeah. And it's so dramatic, that like mm -hmm. flat with the huge mountains. And oh, it's yes. just fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. And there's a lot of greenery. I've, I've lived in North Surrey for a lot of my life, too. And I know it's a huge area with lots of parks and greenery. So I could see that for sure. Um, are you a cat person or a dog person? Or neither. Or neither, or neither yeah. You could be neither, too. Or a another animal. dog person. Yeah. Oh, that's a for sure. Uh-oh. Okay. <laughs> Have you had some bad experiences with cats? <laughs> I'm just a dog person. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a dog? Uh, not anymore. Not We've anymore. had a few dogs over the years. Great. Awesome. They're great. Um, okay. Question number three. Now that you've retired, um, 
have you or do you plan on taking up any new hobbies learning anything new that you didn't maybe have a chance to do when you were working I think I'll just do more of the hobbies that I do already yeah. um my husband and I ride a tandem bicycle and awesome. we love going biking uh, locally and on tours um, we both garden we grow oh, a really? lot of our vegetables oh. and like to garden just to make things look nice mm -hmm. I think in the same vein I might join a cycling club uh, that would be a cycling club for seniors I guess <laughs> and um, and perhaps a naturalist club I have to, I have to figure oh. that out I'm still um, really busy with advocacy and with the BC Pediatric Society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Doctors of BC Retirement is an overstatement, yes. I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. So, so I still have lots of Partial. medical or medical political activities going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very Well, cool. gardening is lovely, except yeah. it's very rainy. We're having January, mm -hmm. but yeah, gardening is wonderful. It's on the horizon. Okay, question number four. Um, it is the first day of summer has come and gone. Um, we're recording this after that, but what is your favorite summer drink of any kind? It depends on the time of day. Oh, okay. Fair enough. <laughs> you can, you yeah. can tell. Yeah. So what about like, let's say if you're home, you're done, ready to just relax in the evening, what would you prefer? Oh, then probably a glass of white wine. Yeah. Mm. And during the rest of the day, probably water. Oh, okay. Gotcha. <laughs> Keeps you going. Um, okay. And our last question, what is your ideal way to spend a weekend? Outside. Mm hmm if it's nice, going for a bike ride or a hike, yeah. working out in the garden. Yeah. I'm kind of repetitive, aren't I? <laughs> no, I was just thinking that sounds like a great <laughs> weekend to me. I know, I was just going to say I'm kind of similar, <laughs> like, like going perfect. for a walk, yeah, reading a book. Yeah. yeah. You find what you love and you stick with it, right? Yeah. So exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, thank you so much. There weren't too bad, these questions, and we kind of got to know you. And a tandem yeah. bike, that is pretty cool, actually. Um, so can you tell us and your, our listeners a little bit about yourself and your professional journey? I know we covered a few things in our intro, but maybe just kind of talk a little bit about the BC Pediatric Society, how you kind of came to be a pediatrician. When I was in school, when I was a kid, I really liked sciences. I also really liked looking after children and I was still a teenager and I thought I'd like to be a pediatrician mm. because then I could do both. I could do the scientific part of medicine and I could help children feel better and their families feel better. Mm. So when I went to university I thought I don't want to narrow myself down too much. I did a, uh, my bachelor's degree in honors math and then I thought if I don't go into medicine I can be a teacher or an engineer. Although. As an engineer, you don't work with people so much, mm -hmm. or kids. And then I thought, yeah, I think I'd like to go into medicine. I think I'd like to go to the East Coast. So I applied to Dalhousie Medical School and I got in. And even all the way through medicine, I wanted to be a pediatrician. I did my electives in pediatrics. And then when I finished medical school at Dalhousie, I went into um, residency training, which is specialty training in, in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in Halifax for that. And then I wanted to move to a different training program for my final year because back in the 80s, most people in um, many of the specialties did change locations mm. for their training programs so that they'd get a little bit more variety. So I went to Winnipeg and did a two-year fellowship in pediatric respirology, which yeah. took me three years because I had a couple of kids during the time. Yeah. And then my husband and I thought we want to move back to BC. So there was a practice to purchase available in Langley, so we moved to Langley. Uh, it was ideal. It was a community consulting practice. I could concentrate a little bit on respirology, mm -hmm. but... I could also do general pediatrics, which included office practice and hospital call. And just picked up a lot of patients that I followed throughout infancy, childhood, and adolescence until they 
aged out of my practice. And then as, yeah, I guess as, you know, as I got a little bit older, a little bit more experience, um, more pediatricians came to the community, so I didn't have to do as much hospital call mm -hmm. and had therefore a little bit of time, although I also had three kids, I started to get into um, a little bit more of, I guess, what you'd call medical politics with the BC mm -hmm. Pediatric Society and the Canadian Pediatric Society. Um, and via the BC Pediatric Society a little bit with doctors of BC. One of the things that really drew me to the BC Pediatric Society was the amount of advocacy mm -hmm. that um, that society does on behalf of pediatricians and on behalf of our patients. So we um, meet with Ministry of Education, MCFD, Ministry of Health surrounding various issues mm -hmm. um, with regards to the systems that our patients are in. I'm actually the past president of the BC Pediatric Society now, but I'm still involved in um, various aspects and in some Doctors of BC committees. I'm also on the Mental Health Developmental Disabilities Committee mm. of the Canadian Pediatric Society. So mm -hmm. we write position statements, et cetera, for educational purposes for pediatricians mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. physicians. That's fantastic. Can I, I stop now? Yeah, yeah, you absolutely <laughs> can. It's very interesting because I think um, it's not super clear to most people that there's advocacy within medicine, lobbying, government, and meeting with the different ministries. And it's, yeah, that piece in itself is interesting. Mm -hmm. And Hin and I have also had contact with DDMHS or the Developmental Disabilities mm -hmm. Mental Health Services mm -hmm. here and there. So that's also an interesting yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And not all like I mean not all pediatricians are involved in all these extra, you know, curricular like I mean extracurricular make us makes it sound like an after school club, but you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like all these really important initiatives that you're involved with, so which is really great as well because you're kind of shaping where pediatrics is gonna go and how clients are gonna be and patients are gonna be treated. So um, thank you. That was really great. And can you talk to us a little bit about your first experience with a patient with Down syndrome? No. Oh, no. Nope. Oh, no. Anything so we can... I don't remember. Oh, okay. Okay, I maybe not your first one, but I mean, obviously remember. keeping confidentiality in yeah. mind, maybe just you can use a person that, you know, that you have seen with Down syndrome. Like, what were your initial thoughts? Like, how was it meeting with the families? Like, maybe just talk to our listeners a little bit about what you looked for when you met with somebody with Down syndrome. I don't know if I want this on the record. I'll tell you, when I was, you know, when I was early in practice, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> really that's, fair. That's very fair. Yeah, absolutely. And the pediatricians that call us are in that yeah. position. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, I, yeah. I would look at the baby who whose birth I attended or whom I saw shortly after birth, or I can remember a couple of times I would look at the newborn baby that I was at the delivery because they were preterm or the uh, baby I'd been asked to see shortly after birth because the family doctor or the nurses thought maybe the baby had Down syndrome or I can remember a couple of infants that I saw quite late in infancy when they were a few months old mm -hmm. and I would say say to myself what what am I going to say how am I going to approach this mm -hmm. I have to tell these parents that I think their baby has down syndrome and mm -hmm. and that's really awful I don't after a few years I didn't feel that way anymore mm -hmm. yeah. I would talk to the parents and I'd say I think your baby has down syndrome we're going to have to do some tests I would probably say it's a little bit more lengthy and mm -hmm. sympathetically than that, but that mm -hmm. would be the summary, and discuss with them some of the implications. There, there wouldn't usually be very many questions at first, and, and I would always try and say that 
I'm here, we're here to support your baby. There's lots that can be done. Mm -hmm. And I expect that your child is going to grow up to be healthy and happy and achieve his or her potential. And that's what we're going to aim for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just, it just makes me think of some of the stories that we hear from some of our other parents about how that is not the conversation that they yeah. had with their doctor and it was quite you know a negative experience so yeah. and I think that's kind of one of the reasons why we're so excited to have you here is to kind of you know teach other pediatricians or anyone else listening that there are people out there that do deliver the news in a way that's hopeful and looks towards the future so yeah yeah um, so what you're kind of talking about is balancing the sympathy towards the family at the news that you're having to share with them because it is a big piece of news Mm -hmm. not necessarily a terrible piece of news but not what people are expecting to hear Mm -hmm. versus here's my stock list of all of the things that we need to now refer Mm -hmm. some of them are critical and crucial and that is a really difficult balancing act Um, do you find that you have this mental list of things that need to happen when somebody's really young, like in the under five range and they're coming to you, is there a list of referrals that you make sort of automatically or are you things that you're looking for in that age group? Um, yes, if you start with birth, then uh, diagnosis of Down syndrome and which type of Down syndrome mm-hmm. has to be confirmed by doing um, chromosomes, which is a blood test, and Mm -hmm. the answer, um, the results of that are uh, quite rapid now. Mm -hmm. We always have to do a blood count because there may be problems, um, particularly with the white blood cell count. Mm -hmm. Uh, It may be too high. And of course, we always have to do a complete physical exam uh, before the tests. Mm -hmm. I should have said that first. (laughs) And see if there are any problems on physical exam, one of the big problems would be um, a cardiac defect, a heart murmur. Whether or not we hear a heart murmur, um, we refer babies to cardiology. All babies with Down syndrome should be seen by a cardiologist, obviously, Mm -hmm. depending on what kind of murmur we might hear um, and what their oxygen levels are. It Mm -hmm. may be a really, really urgent referral, like Mm -hmm. today, Mm -hmm. or it may be a referral that can wait a few days. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if the baby is uh, very stable from a cardiac point of view and we don't hear a murmur, then we can probably wait a few days or a week or two weeks for a cardiologist to see them. Uh, We need to ensure that uh, the gastrointestinal system is working Mm -hmm. all right. So as far as feeding, uh, possible vomiting, possible constipation, Mm -hmm. other possible signs of bowel obstruction, which is not common, but a little bit more common than in typical kids. Mm -hmm. There's routine newborn screening that's done on all babies now. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice because some of these screens cover the... um, more common medical problems that kids or babies with Down syndrome will have. So, for example, all babies in BC have hearing screen. Yes, I've mm-hmm. actually done those, and it is so delightful. Yeah, those teeny mm-hmm. tiny babies. Yeah, yeah. And they have to be quiet. Yeah, that's hard. <laughs> that's the hard part. That's the hard yes. part. <laughs> um, we monitor all children, um, babies, newborns for jaundice, which mm-hmm. is a little bit more common in babies with Down syndrome, but not a big problem, and mm-hmm. we. If they're too jaundiced, we treat it the same as with all other babies. We have the heel prick, the Mm -hmm. metabolic screening, Mm -hmm. and that includes uh, screening for hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. As you know, hypothyroidism um, is much more common in people with Down syndrome. It's usually uh, acquired a bit later in life, but there's still a, a little bit of an increase in congenital. So being born with hypothyroidism Mm -hmm. and um, all babies in BC um, are well all hospitals are working towards and probably most hospitals in BC are um, now doing the critical congenital heart disease screening which is just oximetry Mm -hmm. of both arms and 
both legs so mm -hmm. that will help to pick up the more mm -hmm. severe and urgent congenital heart problems that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So those things are done for all babies in BC and will help to pick up mm -hmm. some of the problems that babies with Down syndrome might mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. So what feels like a lot of testing is, well, most of it is standard testing exactly. for any baby yeah. and there's a bit of extra mm -hmm. when you've got a little one with Down syndrome. Yeah, the, yeah. the blood work for the blood count and the chromosomes. Yeah. Mm -hmm and seeing a cardiologist, mm -hmm. but we start with the, the, uh, the screening. Can you just explain to our listeners, you were talking a little bit about looking at the white blood count, and so and that's elevated. For those that may not know what that is an indicator of, or just like, why would that be something that you would look for? And what does that indicate? The disorder is called myeloproliferative disorder, mm -hmm. and that means basically the bone marrow is making a lot of white blood cells gotcha. okay. Okay. and that is something that occurs in um, newborns and very young infants who have down syndrome not that commonly but it can occur so we uh, check all of them generally there's no treatment needed just monitoring mm -hmm. generally we would refer these babies to a hematologist to help us monitor them. Or if you lived far away from the lower mainland and a hematologist, the family doctor or the pediatrician might just maintain telephone contact mm -hmm. with the hematologist. And so it's monitored until it resolves, which might be a few weeks or a few months of age. Interesting. That is super mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. because most of our, I mean, we're doing this interview in COVID time, so everyone is more aware than maybe usual about what immunosuppression is. Mm -hmm. And most of our students fall into that category of immunosuppression, which is actually the opposite problem, if I'm not mistaken, of having too low of a white cell count and too low of an immune response. So does that at some point then switch? Uh, it resolves. The, the main problem with myeloproliferative disorder is that the babies with Down syndrome who have had it are at increased risk of leukemia mm -hmm. right. later on in childhood or adolescence. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so it is something you want to follow for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is very good to know. Yeah. Um, See, this is why we have you. The immune <laughs> suppression is, is unrelated. Um, the, there is something to do with the chromosomal um, disorder mm -hmm. that results in overall um, a less responsive, less active immune mm -hmm. system, which means as kids get older, they're more prone to, say, the staph skin infections, the yeah. nail fungal infections, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that is interesting. Um, if we go forward and age a little bit and think about our school-aged kids, is there anything in that particular age group that you're really watching out carefully for? You mentioned immunosuppression. Is there other things that you're watching out for that age group? We um, can we back up to infancy? Yeah, let's back it right up. <laughs> back up. That's happy good. to back it up. Yeah. Yes. Let's yes. talk more. Yes, we need the whole picture, so let's back it. Up. <laughs> I'm glad we have an editor. Oh, it's fine. It's I don't even think this needs to be no, edited. It's, it's just a conversation. So yeah. All good. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's all good. Um, the other thing that should be done in in shortly after birth is uh, referral to infant development program. Yeah, mm. and that's mm. that's probably one of the most important aspects actually. Mm -hmm. Then during infancy, um, babies with Down syndrome need their routine well baby care. They need their two month, four month, six month, twelve month immunizations. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be weighed and measured, mm -hmm. and their growth plotted on a growth chart. For and, Down syndrome. Yeah. Yes. And there are growth charts for Down syndrome. Yes. And I have the link to those if you like. Yes, that'd be great. And um, they should have influenza immunization. Again, Always. because mm -hmm. you know, increased risk of respiratory infections, mm -hmm. group bronchiolitis, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and possibly if the baby has uh, a cardiac defect. And they may also be eligible for RSV 
prophylaxis mm -hmm, for their mm -hmm. first one or two winters, mm -hmm. depending on their uh, cardiac status and mm -hmm. their um, lung status. Um, hearing tests need to be done every six months, starting mm -hmm. in infancy. So even if the newborn hearing screen was normal, hearing tests need to be done. Mm -hmm. And sooner, if there's any, any concerns, most babies and young children with Down syndrome end up needing to see an ear, nose, and throat surgeon. Mm -hmm. Many need tubes in their ears because they have chronic middle ear effusions. Um, some will have neurosensory hearing loss. So we generally want pediatric ENT referral fairly early in life with regular follow-up um, at least until adolescence and probably longer. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, all babies with Down syndrome should see an ophthalmologist, an eye mm -hmm. doctor, preferably a pediatric one, but there's lots of community mm -hmm. general ophthalmologists who are great. An ophthalmologist, not optometrist, because exactly. that is a conversation an that I've had with parents. Is, they're different, yeah. yes. Okay, yeah. great. An, op uh, an optometrist can assess the vision, and probably most little kids with Down syndrome aren't going to be able to tell you Mm -hmm. which way the E is pointing on the vision chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, an ophthalmologist can use the special lenses, etc., to look at the retina, look for cataracts, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, blood tests need to be done during infancy every six months to check thyroid and the blood count. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, for the white cell count. For the white cell count um, as a screen for leukemia. Mm -hmm. There's some changes with the red blood cells too, but those usually don't make any difference to mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. And going back to routine well baby care, all kids are supposed to see a dentist for their first dental checkup, which is usually a get to know you mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. tell the parents Count to the brush the teeth yeah. Yeah. <laughs> by one year. Yeah. Okay. And then most of these um, follow ups continue through early childhood. So, again, mm -hmm. routine well baby checks, weigh in, um, measuring mm -hmm. at 18 months and pre-kindergarten and an annual flu shot immunizations and every six months every six to 12 months or if there's symptoms through early childhood so up until school age you mm -hmm. want to check the blood count the thyroid and the ttg for celiac disease screening mm -hmm. um, ongoing ear nose and throat follow-up ongoing ophthalmology follow-up which may be once or twice a year depending mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and regular dental follow-up just like all other kids mm -hmm. um, and developmental support with you know more about that than I do <laughs> infant <laughs> development program OT mm -hmm. and SLP mm -hmm. etc yeah. all of those things mm -hmm. so it's a lot mm -hmm. that's it's the lot. thing it's a lot it's a lot of management um, do they need the, they being the families need to come to a pediatrician for every single one of those visits or do they go to a family doctor how would a family now mind you we have people listening from all over the world so this would be a bc specific question but who should they go to as their point person for these visits in general it's probably best if a pediatrician is the main doctor for following the specific problems that may occur with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. It's best if the families and children maintain contact with their family doctor. Hopefully they'll have the same family doctor for decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the family doctor should do the well baby checks, the immunizations. If they do immunizations, often people go to public health unit, of course, for their immunizations. Pediatricians in BC are consultants, so we don't do immunizations. On the other hand, the family doctors may not have Down syndrome growth curves. Pediatricians will have Down syndrome growth curves, mm -hmm. so we can monitor the growth. We know when we should be doing the blood work and we know a little bit better how to interpret the results of the blood work and what to do if it's not normal. So those are the sorts of things that it's best to see a pediatrician about. Mm -hmm. And referrals to subspecialists mm -hmm. could be undertaken by the family doctor or the pediatrician, but again, the pediatrician is aware of the specific problems that kids with Down syndrome might have mm -hmm. and who might be the best 
specialist, subspecialist to refer them to. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think, a cooperation between the family doctor and the pediatrician, but the family doctor more for routine, well baby, well child care. And, you know, obviously, if your child has an ear infection, and the pediatrician isn't available, you're going to go to the family doctor, which is another good reason it's <laughs> good to have both. Mm -hmm. yeah. So mm -hmm. that uh, if one's not available, the yeah, other one will be. Yeah, you have throat or whatever. Yeah, those yeah. kind of things. Mm -hmm. Now, documents, like the AAP puts out a guideline for the long list that you just gave of all the kinds of screening. Do you mm -hmm. recommend that parents bring that kind of document to appointments to help themselves? know what's happening and what's coming next? Or is that something that you would give to families? How does that work? I'm probably a bit lazy. I don't usually give it to them. Sometimes I remember to tell them about it. Um, we do discuss it to some extent, and I say I try to follow the guidelines. Mm -hmm. In Canada, we do things a little bit differently than mm -hmm. um, in the States, so we mm -hmm. don't follow the AAP guidelines completely. Right. And maybe we do a few, somewhat fewer investigations, and I'm particularly thinking of sleep studies, polysomnography, yeah. Yeah. but we do need to clinically monitor mm -hmm. that sort of thing if there's sleep problems, um, mm -hmm. which we should do right from early infancy. Mm -hmm. That was actually on my list from early infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, yes. sleep problems and eating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there are also some uh, Canadian guidelines, uh, the Surrey Place guidelines, which are helpful. And so it's pro, and I have the link or reference yeah, for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. We it's probably behave. good for parents to have that. Sometimes, if the kids have a lot of medical problems, and this applies to any child in my practice, some some children have one medical problem that they're seeing a pediatrician for, and some have eight medical problems that they're seeing a pediatrician for, mm -hmm. I say, you know what? You should get a binder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, we'll give you the copies of your test results and some of the copies of the subspecialist letters. And, and this is the sections you should have for your binder mm -hmm. so that you can keep things organized. Yeah. Kind of like my chart, but it's your copy. Your copy yeah. Absolutely. And I think it gets complicated because all of these things I'm doing a motion that no one on the podcast will see um, <laughs> they all sort of interlock so you know mm -hmm. the the ears are related to the throat which is related to the gastro which is related etc 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 so it gets <laughs> confusing I think for some parents because they don't know which test is for which thing mm -hmm. and they try and keep it separate but it's actually not really separate mm -hmm. so yeah a binder is a great idea yeah and if they have a copy of the um, AAP guidelines or the Canadian guidelines in the front of their binder, then they say, oh yeah, I gotta ask the doctor. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, we haven't done that for a year and a half because we all forgot, because we all do forget. Yeah, well, totally. Yeah. And just, just to clarify, AAP is the American Academy of Pediatric yeah. Guidelines, if our Correct. listeners are wondering yeah. what those are. And we do definitely, um, as a part of a, uh, a new parent package, or just if I'm meeting a, a, a tiny one for the first time, or we have lots of families that come in and are immigrate to Canada or are not from Canada originally that we give these guidelines to. I was just curious, you were mentioning that there's Canada does things a little bit differently, especially with the sleep component. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about why that is. Why is it that testing, is it that there's less testing for sleep apnea in Canada? And is there a reason for that? Because this is a conversation that I have with parents all the time. So it would be really nice to kind of get your perspective on that a little bit. Even in the AAP guidelines, they point out that the testing is not always available. Mm -hmm. I think that's the Any thing. test that we do in medicine should be clinically indicated. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't just do a test to relieve anxiety. Doing a test actually can create a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can lead to more tests. And if you don't have a good clinical reason, then you may get results that don't mean a lot. Yeah. So we know that obstructive sleep apnea in people with Down syndrome is silent very often mm -hmm. um, and can result in behavioral problems, um, 
exacerbate mental health problems and in the long term can cause um, quite a few physical problems that will occur in anybody who has mm -hmm. obstructive sleep apnea that's not treated. If a child is thriving and they aren't having any problems that are apparent by history or physical exam and they're not snoring and they're not having the behavioral manifestations of mm -hmm. sleep deprivation mm -hmm. and you're keeping an eye on it and you have good communication with the family then you probably don't need to do a sleep study if something changes mm -hmm. that could be an indication of a sleep disorder then you should get a sleep study mm -hmm. so that's the first half of it and that's that's the part that I tend to go by Mm -hmm. I don't do a test unless it's indicated. Mm -hmm. As a child with Down syndrome gets older and older, um, the risk of obstructive sleep apnea increases, so your threshold for wanting to do the test would become lower. The other part is, to tell you the truth, we have very little access to sleep studies. So yeah. even when we think that this person really needs polysomnography, it's really difficult to mm -hmm. get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There is a third part for kids and teenagers with Down syndrome. When I do raise the issue with parents, they say, it's not going to work. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's a big, yep. that's a big part, yes. or she <laughs> is just gonna going to that. take all that equipment off, yep. and it's just not going to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We won't get it done. Yeah. And lo and behold, that does happen quite yeah. often. Yeah. When we do finally get there, mm -hmm. after a year or two wait, mm -hmm. it just doesn't happen, mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, despite everybody's best efforts. Mm -hmm. And then the last part to doing a sleep study is if it is abnormal, then the recommended treatment mm -hmm. is usually CPAP mm -hmm. um, or some kind of machine. Yeah. And yeah. the parents will tell me, That's not good. it's That's not, not gonna going happen. to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what yeah. else can we do? Um, as the years go by, there are, be there are less invasive treatments mm -hmm. for obstructive sleep apnea mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be helpful. But, you know, there's, there's all those steps. Yeah, all uh, if the kid is really young, they may need their tonsils and adenoids out. Um, and very often the symptoms are so obvious that you don't need to do a sleep study. Yep. So you go by the clinical indications mm -hmm. first. So the biggest thing that stands out for me from what you've just outlined is the importance of the parents telling their care provider, pediatrician or family doctor, in this case, hopefully pediatrician, exactly what is going on. And I think mm -hmm. that some communication breaks down there where they don't think that the pediatrician maybe wants or needs to know how bad the behavior is at home, how many times the child's waking up at night, whether or not their child's waking up with a gasp or yeah. you know not wanting to Can go to focus sleep. in school or mm -hmm. do any mm -hmm. of the and yeah. all of that information mm -hmm. is important for your care provider to know so that they can mm -hmm. decide whether a test is in the yeah. right next step there, yeah, yeah there's something called um, diagnostic overshadowing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. if the child is being stubborn and if they're having a lot of tantrums you can't say oh he's like that because he's got down syndrome Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a change from the previous behavior and maybe it's happening because of a sleep disorder. Mm -hmm. yeah. One thing that I absolutely love is when parents bring in a video mm -hmm. of their child sleeping. <laughs> also, we also yeah. love that. So, uh, yeah. yes. so that's, that's really useful information yeah. and I just go, whoa, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think we also recommend parents take stock of, like know what the symptoms are for obstructive mm -hmm. sleep apnea. Mm -hmm keep an eye on it, keep a record, a video. Cause I know I've had some parents that say, oh, they're completely still when they're sleeping, they're not moving, but when they get hooked up to a polysomnogram, they're having over 200 apneic episodes. So it's just, I think, trying to get Scary. to understand, mm -hmm. you know, what to look for and then kind of advocate mm -hmm. as well from on their mm -hmm. part, because you're not seeing the child there at night yeah, when they're sleeping, yeah. right? So you can't yeah. say anything, yeah. 
And there, I mean, there's other things too, where so a child things, yeah. will sleep in a really unusual posture, yeah. neck fully mm-hmm. arched yeah. and, or sitting up. Yeah. And they're like, well, that's just how they sleep. I'm like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's probably not, not. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the typical way so to sleep. Things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All kinds of things. Great. Yeah. Thank you for outlining that. I think yes. that'll be super helpful for, for parents and other therapists also that are Absolutely. Listening. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Let's move to, can we go to school age? Sure. Would that be a good next step? Okay. Let's move into school age. I think a lot of it is the same kind of monitoring. Is there anything that happens differently when a child enters school age years? They're going to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of transition. Mm-hmm. Uh, the good part is child development, supported child development, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists, they take care of a lot of that transition. But as a pediatrician, I, I talk to parents about transitions and about school. And I think it's um, a good idea if the family has a pediatrician on side for communication with the school mm. and the, um, the school personnel and what supports might be needed. Um, obviously, they have the allied health, such as SLPs, OTs, um, child development consultants uh, on board as well, but they need all the support that they can get to advocate. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I feel like I would cry with joy if a pediatrician oh joined gosh. an IEP <laughs> meeting. I would be so excited. I don't think in my years of working. <laughs> no, I've it hasn't happened, before, but it would be awesome. <laughs> but it would oh. be great. <laughs> oh, some pediatricians do that. We've talked to schools or. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Um, another thing that happens when all kids go to school, they stop uh, playing as much yeah. because they're sitting in school yeah. Yeah. and yes. it's a little bit more difficult to join the soccer team mm-hmm. and to take skating lessons and to be in organized sports and some for some kids um, whose mobility uh, occurs later it's more difficult to play with their friends at recess mm-hmm. so that's something that uh, needs specific attention um, and that's difficult. I can't say who, sh- who should pay attention to it. Um, mm-hmm. It's really hard. Mm-hmm. So there's adaptive recreation programs through the municipal parks and recs. Mm-hmm. And there's Special Olympics when the kids get older and the pre-Special Olympics for mm-hmm. when they're younger. And I think that maybe they'd need extra support in gym class at school too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. From the um, from the special education mm-hmm. assistant, so those sorts of things are important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Another, um, a, f- a few of the neurodevelopmental or neuropsychiatric um, or psychiatric problems are more likely to show up during school age years. Mm-hmm. So autism, of course, everybody wants autism to be diagnosed when a child is two or three, mm-hmm. so early intervention can start. It's really hard in people with Down syndrome because people with Down syndrome usually have speech delay, Mm -hmm. often have um, mobility delay, and just general delay in other aspects of their development. So it's a little bit hard to identify and diagnose autism. ADHD is more common in kids with Down syndrome and ADHD is something that you can, that you diagnose once a child is school age. You can say when they're two or three or four or five, "Hmm, I wonder if they have ADHD, but you can't diagnose it until they're school age. So that's something that needs monitoring. And the kids who have inattentive type of ADHD, uh, rather than the hyperactive impulsive inattentive type, um, are nice and quiet and sit there and daydream. So it's even harder Mm-hmm. to pick it up. So mm-hmm. so you do need to monitor and ask mm-hmm. specific questions. And then as you get a little bit later in elementary age school children, um, anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder may start to emerge, like those are typical ages. Yep. And um, those are more common in kids with Down syndrome. So that's another thing that you need to monitor for. And again, not just assume it's, oh, 
they've got Down syndrome, so they're stubborn. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. So glad you I'm said so that. So glad. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, just because somebody has Down syndrome doesn't mean you can't also have a laundry list of mm-hmm. other That's things. That's the diagnostic overshadowing on. again. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, one thing that I, I find helpful is for parents to take lots of video for the purpose of a baseline, but also then it's very clear and you could show your pediatrician this or your fam- care provider, depending on where you live, um, what this change is looking like. Is that something that you would welcome in office? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because kids don't behave the same in an office when exactly. as they do at home or at school where they're more comfortable at school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, you know, often kids are much quieter and well-behaved and then others get more stubborn and hide under the chair, kick you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. When they're stressed out. Yeah. Um, can I also just, since we're kind of on school age or older school age, um, are there any considerations around puberty for for our families because I'm having, I have a few kids on my caseload where sleep is just a complete mess right now and we're wondering if it's a pu- puberty thing or hormonal change. Like are there things that um, that might be a bit different for kids with Down syndrome at that time versus typical kids? There's different? a lot that's exactly the same as, mm-hmm. as all other kids. Mm-hmm. And if their sleep is getting messed up, um, I wouldn't just blame it on puberty. Yeah, uh, You have to look at what are the other reasons? Mm-hmm. There, there are, there's a myriad of reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, the loss of, of schedule these days, yeah. Yeah. Um, anxiety, mm-hmm. uh, decreased physical activity if, if um, there's no specific recreation programs and if both parents are working and trying to school all their kids at once and aren't getting everybody outside Mm -hmm. or don't have a facility to get them outside there's just such a myriad of reasons Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I would I think I'd really want to look at particularly is it lack of routine um, and is it increased anxiety Mm -hmm. related to that and Mm -hmm. is there um, and is is there more screen time Um, which is happening to a lot of people and is not necessarily a bad thing right um, right. And a lot of the screen time is related to school and its education, yeah. but it, it still may disrupt the sleep. So there's mm-hmm. just so many things. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like there's any medical issues within the population of people with Down syndrome that are currently getting less attention than they need? Things that are getting regularly missed? Or yeah, are there any population trends, I guess is what I'm asking, that you've noticed in your practice? Do you mean related to COVID or just nope. overall? <laughs> overall, not related to COVID at all. Um, but you know, things like thyroid issues are mm-hmm. way more common than we expected and, and mm-hmm. kids are getting caught late or something to that effect, not necessarily thyroid. I think the sleep issue is a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody knows and it's easy to do a blood test for thyroid and celiac disease mm-hmm. and a CBC to check for leukemia. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you kind of forget, but then you remember later, somebody remembers, the parent remembers, or the family doctor remembers, or the pediatrician remembers, and hopefully everybody's keeping track so they know that it's supposed to come up. Um, I think those medical issues, and and as long as the heart was checked during early infancy and cardiology is following it again, those, those ones are more straightforward. They're older, we know about them. Things like autism, um, and I've missed it, you know, myself, I, okay, is this stubborn, is this OCD, and mm-hmm. we've, all, we've all missed it, we've all delayed the diagnosis, and mm-hmm. as I mentioned, so I think that is one thing, because it doesn't make a lot of difference to the person, but it will make a lot of difference to how you approach and support mm-hmm. the person. Mm-hmm. Very well said, mm-hmm. yes. So I think that that's... Autism is one thing that's important. Obstructive sleep apnea Mm -hmm. um, is important. Although we went through that and it's sometimes, well, yeah, it's probably there, but what are we going to do? And Mm -hmm. let's Mm -hmm. just go as far as we can. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Quite often people think that, oh, my my kids outgrown their ear infection, so we don't need hearing tests anymore. And it's Mm -hmm. really important um, to monitor the hearing lifelong. 
because it's not only just related to ear infections mm -hmm. and small mid-face, small ear canals, etc. There's increased risk of neurosensory loss, which increases as you get older. Mm -hmm. So hearing needs to be monitored, and I think that is forgotten. Mm -hmm. Anything it just else seems you can low. think of that you found no. that tends to be forgotten. No, I mean those are the major <laughs> you ones. You hit the major ones. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we we have a lot of discussions about the dual diagnosis of Down syndrome and autism um, because it is a particularly gray area. There is overlap between the two, mm -hmm. and sometimes it's very hard to pick out: is this one plus another one, or is this just a really well-rounded one mm -hmm. diagnosis? It, it's, it can be really complicated, and that is why the average age of diagnosis is so much later. I think the average age is like 14, mm -hmm. it's shockingly later mm -hmm. um, and challenging. And I think the older beliefs, too, that you couldn't have a dual diagnosis are still staying on occasionally, so that adds complications. Yeah. I think you can even, it. like Dr. Pointer was mentioning earlier, about ADHD seems to be more prevalent mm -hmm. or. You know, and I think there's also aspects of ADHD that are kind of overlap with Down syndrome and autism. So it's like figuring mm -hmm. out how to yeah. tease it apart, mm -hmm. what is what. And I think that, and honestly, like, I mean, a lot of our interventions can work on all three, but knowing, like, especially with medications, especially for ADHD, if medication can help, that's kind of where I sometimes hit a, a bit of a a wall with some parents where they're and I understand that I mean like you know not every parent wants to medicate their child but I'm just like but I wonder if that medication for ADHD could help them focus mm -hmm. and you know I mean you can definitely please feel free to speak to this but like there are different medications out there for ADHD there's different titration of doses and sometimes it takes a while for it to like what are your thoughts on that aspect of exactly if if a child, any child, is unable to complete their daily activities satisfactorily, uh, or if they can't learn, mm -hmm. then because they can't focus, then you want to help. Mm -hmm. And medication is one small aspect of that. It's always, almost always worth a try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it doesn't work, then there's another medication. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's worth a try to try a second one if the first one doesn't work too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for families to know too, is that it medication trials are, it's a process, mm -hmm. not necessarily a very fun process. It can be difficult mm -hmm. to go yeah. through that. Um, but the families who are able to stick with it, in my clinical experience, often do find something that helps their child, mm -hmm. maybe by the second or maybe by the third, yeah. sometimes by the fourth medication, we've got something that helps our students learn and it unfortunately it just is complicated because of how our students metabolize medications and how things interact mm -hmm. um, I wish it was easier we all do but it's just a piece of it yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how has in your experience how has healthcare for kids with Down syndrome changed over the course of your career and where do you feel like things can get better going forward considering your advocacy role that you're in right now from a pediatrician's point of view, I think the change is with more recognition of the importance of developmental support, mm -hmm. not just the medical yeah. aspects. And a really big factor for probably the majority of pediatricians now is, uh, is working as part of a team and not just being the doctor that does a checkup and orders some blood tests, mm -hmm. but being part of the team to support the medical and developmental and social aspects for the child and family. Mm -hmm. And a lot of pediatricians are really, really happy to work as part of a team with uh, allied health people. And um, another another thing that's important, I think, is the the role of the pediatrician or if there isn't a pediatrician the family doctor in uh, coordinating all the aspects of medical care mm -hmm. and uh, arranging the appropriate referrals and sort of being the the central repository of, mm -hmm. of the child's um, medical mm -hmm. history and chart mm -hmm. whatever form that charts in mm -hmm. um, and you alluded to this a little bit earlier but 
um, just to rephrase, uh, what, what, what is um, something that you can tell our parents? What is some of advice you can give them in terms of advocating for their kids for these tests? So I know you said, of course, that you need to have a clinical reason and a clinical, you know, a, to get a lot of the testing done. And there's a lot that are already written into the, um, but if a parent is worried about a thyroid condition or if they're worried about something that they've heard another from another parent um, of, because of their kids with Down syndrome, like how do you, what, what, would be your, what would be your advice to that parent to like how to approach their pediatrician? If that didn't make sense, I can easily read. Oh, it makes sense, but I don't know if I know the answer. You you can edit that part out too. Um, (laughs) If the parents have the guidelines Mm -hmm. and say, "Oh, well, look, you know, we're supposed to do it," and and if they can explain why this is important for their child, Mm -hmm. what are they seeing in their child Mm -hmm. that might indicate that this uh, test needs to be done? Yeah. Mm -hmm. for example, has the child's growth fallen off? Are they are they growing more slowly? Mm-hmm. Which is um, possibly due to hypothyroidism mm-hmm. or celiac disease. Yeah. So we as doctors need to pay attention to that physical sign. Mm-hmm. Or do they have constipation or some yeah. other change in their bowel habits, mm-hmm. which again could be uh, evidence of hypothyroidism or celiac disease. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've probably talked about sleep and behavior and yeah. Mm-hmm. growth <laughs> yeah. um, sufficiently but but for the parent and all parents know their kids yeah. and advocate for their kids and uh, if you know if they're not getting any satisfaction from one doctor they should go to another one <laughs> yeah yeah we've heard um, we have, we but, have, we've had parents but also questions. they have to accept the explanation because the mm. test shouldn't be done just to do a test, mm-hmm. yeah. Unless there's a yeah, reason, so. there you know there are sc- the screening for thyroid, celiac, CBC should be done regularly, um, mm-hmm. and it should be done if there's symptoms. You don't say, oh, okay, well you're not due for your screen for eleven months, so we won't do it till then. So if there's symptoms, mm-hmm. but if there's absolutely no reason to do a thyroid test when you had a normal one four months ago mm-hmm. and there's no symptoms, then yeah. You shouldn't go chasing after getting mm-hmm. another thyroid test, for mm-hmm. example. Mm-hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I, I think this is a lot of information that parents have to kind of keep in mind and juggle and etc. And I am an mm-hmm. advocate. I love a good note-taking session. So if a family is able to sort of jot down and take a little bit of a snapshot because we forget, right? Did that happen when they were two or when they were three? Did they used to sleep better? I don't remember because now I'm tired, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So if they can take a little snapshot of, okay, on their birthday or every six months or whatever, right now they're eating this much, they're constipated, they're sleeping that much so that we can keep track over time. Is it getting worse? How much worse? Is it getting better? How much better? And then we have a much clearer idea of how many tests are needed and which ones. That's a really good idea. If a parent has time, yeah, Yeah. it's hard to even take those notes, isn't it? It is. But then again, if you have the binder, maybe you can just jot it down. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, Yeah. exactly. But it it is hard to keep up with that. It is, and it's hard to remember. But I think it it adds gravity to parents' concerns when they come Mm -hmm. in and say, we're really worried about this, and they're able to show why yeah. because you know a few months ago he was eating way better and sleeping way better or whatever mm-hmm. the issue is I think that kind of thing really makes it clear to the care provider what's going on yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Dr. Pointer thank you so much for taking the time out to chat with us today I think yes. I can just picture so many of our parents listening to this and be like okay this makes sense and mm-hmm. um, and I know and I loved um your point about involving allied health professionals because we are all about collaboration we want to pick your guys brains (laughs) all all day you know because we feel like we learn so much even though we're not ever going to be giving medical advice it's just as an OT and an SLP we see our client as a whole when we can consider all aspects and medical is such a big component for our kids with down syndrome Mm -hmm. so it was super helpful Um, you did mention a couple of resources earlier um, in terms of the links to a growth chart and um, you were talking about the Surrey Place guidelines. Was that like, a, I was just curious if you could 
explain what that was and then if you have any other resources and we can link all these to our page our website episode page as well well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah. So thank you very much. I, I think you already knew everything already. <laughs> um, I have a list of resources so I can give them to you. Um, the, um, the Canadian Health Watch Table for Down Syndrome. That's a good one. We that's like a good that. one. Is, yeah. is um, from Surrey Place. Oh, okay, oh, that's, that's what that was. Oh, okay. okay, gotcha. Great. Mm -hmm. That's on our website already, yeah. but we can link it in the page as well for the episode. Great. Mm -hmm. Are there any other resources that you feel like are helpful besides a really good three ring binder? <laughs> yeah. The BC Pediatric Society has a lot of useful links um, mm -hmm. for patients and families and, and patients in general. And one other thing that, um, skipping ahead a little bit from um, childhood, uh, pediatricians are important in transitioning patients to what we call adult care. Mm -hmm. Adult care is in quotes. Uh, mm -hmm. So back to their family doctor and to adult specialists for follow-up. And mm -hmm. BC Pediatric Society website, uh, www.bcpeds.ca, has um, a lot of transition resources, mainly for physicians, but also for patients and families. Uh, BC Children's On Track Mm -hmm. uh, program mm -hmm. track is TRAC uh, has a huge amount of transition resources. Awesome. Very person centered. Um, we had uh, I actually meant to ask you this a bit earlier. You um, are you were saying that you're still involved in some advocacy and some of the some of the other legal policy making mm -hmm. things. Are there is there anything you could share with us of what's upcoming? Like what are you working on or just curious to know where this... Well, I can tell you what we did last December. Yeah. <laughs> um, Robin Friedland, Dr. Robin Friedlander is a mm -hmm. neuropsychiatrist at Children's and Dr. Allison Laswick, who is developmental pediatrician mm -hmm. with the Center for Child Development in Surrey, and I did um, a, a submission um, under the banner of the BC Pediatric Society to the um, Select Standing Committee on Children and Youth with Special Needs. One thing that is um, not quite organized, but you probably are aware that several groups right now, um, and one being the uh, Child and Youth Mental Health Substance Use um, Community of Practice, which is Child and Youth Mental health in general, um, not specifically developmentally and for people with developmental disabilities. Um, and um, uh, a few pediatricians such as Dr. Christine Locke um, and Dr. Wilma Arruda. Um, and we're just talking about sh how, how involved should BC Pediatric Society be um, in talking to the government, to Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, Children and Family Development about the impact of COVID-19, mm -hmm. um, particularly for children and families um, who are more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how can resources be brought back for them and increased for them? Because mm -hmm. the isolation, the lack of resources, the lack of school over the last three months, as you are probably more aware than I am, has um, really highlighted the vulnerabilities and the gaps in care. Um, another thing that I'm involved in that is a little bit more distant is a Doctors of BC um, and MCFD liaison committee mm. so that Doctors of BC and MCFD can work a little bit more closely together. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, that's a little bit more for doctors who are working within MCFD, such as at Child and Youth Mental Health and some of the, the uh, child development centers, but uh, hopefully the spin-off, mm -hmm. and we're really hoping that one of the big spin-offs will be better communication between MCFD and health uh, for the care of our patients. Well, that would be fantastic. That would be great, yeah. yeah. There's a lot, a lot on your plate right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, retirement no, makes it sound so easy. An this is yeah. sunny retirement. It's really quiet. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All uh, the lives of doctors. My yeah, goodness. Exactly. 
Um, yeah, we would like to thank you again so much for taking the time to chat mm-hmm. with us today. This is super helpful for us. I know it'll be for our families. And oh, yes. Hopefully in the future we can pick your brain some more. Well, and day. thank yeah. you both very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it's been very nice. Thank you. Next week on The Lowdown, a Down Syndrome podcast. And through the time that I spent with the, the SLP, I gained such a greater understanding on how to support his learning through play and was able to take things that he was interested in and use them to target specific skills and got a lot more buy-in out of him. Show the world you love someone with Down syndrome. DSRF Down syndrome Wake Shop is stocked with shirts, baby clothes, bags, and more. Whether you're looking for World Down Syndrome Day products, DSRF brand merchandise, or general Down Syndrome items, we have what you're looking for. Love Live on 21st Chromosome and Down Syndrome Craig lives at dsrf.org slash shop. My name is Andrew. I am the photographer. Photos are my interest because I love scenes. It makes me feel very close to people. My photo cards are on my IT shop through Andrew's eyes at dsif.org slash Andrew. Don't forget to watch my video through Andrew's eyes on YouTube. The Lowdown, the Down Syndrome podcast is a Protection of Down Syndrome Research Foundation. Learn more at dsof.org and join the conversation at TSOF Canada on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. The Lowdown is hosted by Marla Fordan and Hannah Mahmood and is produced by Glenn Hughes. The Lowdown theme music and George Do was written and recorded by Rick Scott.